Hi everybody, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to everyone who is joining with us. It's always a joy for us to be connected with you. And uh, let me invite you into week three. We are into week three of our new series, uh, Under Construction. God is inviting us as a church uh, to be built and to build His kingdom. So for those who are connecting with us for the first time or if you haven't connected with us for some time, uh, let me do some uh, revision for you so you can catch up with us. Uh, we are into this series and uh, the last three weeks we have been, uh, you know, studying the scripture, the promise that has been given to us uh, as, as a church. Zechariah chapter uh, 2 verse 5. Uh, and we've been uh, studying the whole context. Uh, we've been asking ourselves, you know, what did it mean back then when this promise was given to the people of Jerusalem? In other words, the people of uh, God, when they found, um, you know, Jerusalem at a very low state. In other words, it was a, a desolate land. They did not have walls. There was no palace. There was no king. And then God shows up in this vision and says, you know, I am going to be a wall around you. Don't measure up Jerusalem and build it with your own hands. I am going to be your protection and I will be your glory inside. Okay? So, we've been talking about, you know, how God builds and when God builds and, you know, how God has a plan and, you know, how we can come together to be built by God. And this week, uh, you know, uh, if you're taking down notes, here is the title of my sermon. My part in this project my part in this building project, what is my part? That's the question that I want you to, um, you know, uh, maybe think through. This is the question that I want to answer. What is my part in this building project? Uh, I want you to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 7. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 46 and 47. Okay, but before that, I want to remind you that uh, the, when you're involved in God's building project, that is building His church and building His people, I want to remind you that Haggai chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that it pleases God and it glorifies Him. So if you're looking, okay, for ways to please God, I'm going to encourage you that you get involved in this building project of building God's kingdom and building His church that is His people. So, we're going to launch with two points, okay? Here's my first point for all the note takers in the house, okay? Nerds rule the world. So here is point one. When God calls us to build the church, it is an invitation to do our part, not finish the project. I know it's a kind of a long statement. Normally, I don't do long statements for our points, but I want you to take it down. The call... To build the church is an invitation to do our part, not finish the project. I'm going to unpack this, okay? Now, we're going to read a part of uh, Stephen's uh, speech as he is, uh, you know, unpacking, in, in, in other words, kind of giving a brief, okay, of how God led, uh, you know, the people of Israel and their history. And in verse 46, he comments on David's life, and then he talks about, uh, you know, Solomon. And I'm going to read it for you from the New Living Translation. Okay, so verse 46, David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. Now, if you, if you have, uh, you know, your, your marker or your pen, I would uh, like you to go ahead and underline or circle the phrase David and asked in the first verse and then Solomon and built could you do that for me? In verse 46, if you can underline or circle David and asked, and then Solomon and actually built it. Now, let me remind you my point here. When God calls us to be, uh, you know, to, to build the church, He's actually inviting us to do our part, not finish the project. David asked to build the temple, but it was Solomon who built the temple. This is one of those moments that, you know, makes us feel that in some way David is uh, a little lesser than Solomon maybe. Not for all of you. But it kind of makes us, uh, you know, think that uh, somehow David could not accomplish what God would have wanted him to do. Okay. Uh, yes, he was a great warrior. He won great battles for Israel. But there was this rejection by God uh, that he won't be building the temple but his son Solomon will be building the temple because he was a man of war. 
In other words, he was in the battlefield. His hands were, uh, you know, uh, it, it had uh, blood, stains of blood. So, we kind of sometimes think that David in some way could not accomplish what God wanted him to do. But I want you to, uh, you know, kind of come with me to another scripture that is found in the same book, Acts chapter 13. And this kind of comments on how David, you know, lived his life. It doesn't talk about David as the main character in this passage, but it kind of gives a comment of how David lived his life. This is verse 36, Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Now obviously this is, David is not the main character here. But there is a comment that says that David served his purposes. David served God's purposes in his generation. David fulfilled God's will for his generation. In other words, David did what had to be done. David did God's will. David did not fall short of God's will. Rather, the Bible says that David served God's purpose in his generation. I'm going to take you back to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, uh, where we see that, uh, you know, David, in fact, the narrator gives us the reason why David, uh, you know, does not get the permission to, uh, you know, build God's temple. And then we see what David does from uh, verse 6 onwards, okay? 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 6. Then David sent for his son Solomon and instructed him to build a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. My son, I wanted to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord, my God, David told him. But the Lord said to me, you have killed many men in the battles you have fought. And since you have shed so much blood in my sight, you will not be the one to build a temple to honor my name. This kind of, you know, sometimes saddens us. You know, if only David was able to build, he was the perfect model, okay? A perfect character, perfect hero, okay? But then we go to verse 14. Since he's been rejected, let's see what David does. He says, I have worked hard to provide materials for the building of the temple of the Lord. Nearly 4,000 tons of gold, 40,000 tons of silver, and so much iron and bronze that it cannot be weighed. I have gathered timber and stone for the walls, though you may need to add more. You have a large number of skilled stonemasons and carpenters and craftsmen of every kind. You have expert goldsmiths and silversmiths and workers of bronze and iron. Now begin the work and may the Lord be with you. Then David, verse 17, then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to assist Solomon in this project. David is asking to build the temple. But then he gets rejected. In other words, God says, your son is going to build the temple. You know, then David gathers the builders. He, he gathers the goldsmith. He gathers the masons. He gathers the, you know, competent, carpenters. And then he brings the materials together. What I'm trying to tell you is that building God's kingdom is not a one person's task. Building God's church cannot be done by one generation. You might think, you know, what am I trying to say? I hope that you're following me. When God calls us to build His church, you need to understand He's inviting us to not finish the project. He's the one who is heading the project and it is going to be done by every generation, even after us, if God, Jesus, delays to come. This is going to be an ongoing project. No one, no generation is going to finish the project. But every generation is invited by God to do its part. The Bible says that David served God's purpose in his generation. So when God calls us to build his church, to build his people, he's not inviting us to finish the project. No, no generation will be able to finish the project. But every generation will be building on what the other generation has already done. This is something that comes out. I hope that you are catching this. This is something that comes out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
And, uh, you know, Paul is, uh, you know, talking about an issue. Okay, there has been some division in the church where some followers are claiming, uh, you know, that they are followers of Peter. Some are saying they are followers of Apollos. Some are saying that they are followers of Paul. Some are saying they are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, uh, Paul is addressing, okay, addressing this issue. And this is how he speaks to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Stop here. He says, it is God who makes it grow. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. David asked to build the temple. He brought the materials together. Solomon is the one who built it. But God is the one who is building his church. Everyone has a part. But Paul reminds them that it is God who makes it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. What a beautiful statement. It's not about who is asking to build the temple or who is collecting the materials or who finally accomplishes it. You need to understand that when we talk about building the kingdom, it is God who is building the kingdom and everyone is given an opportunity to contribute to that and play their part. And then he goes on to say, the one who plants and the one who waters works together, work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their hard work. Both will be rewarded for their hard work. For we are both God's workers and you are God's field and you are God's building. You are God's building. David asked, Solomon built but both of them served God's purpose in their own generation. I want to remind this, I keep re repeating this, but for a good reason, that when God calls you and tells you, you know, tag along and build God's kingdom, build God's church. It's the church where Jesus is the cornerstone, where, uh, you know, the prophets Okay, are the foundations, the apostles are the foundations. Now he's calling us to build his church. He's not asking us to finish the project. No, it's going to go as an ongoing project. He's asking us to complete our task and serve our generation. Amen. I hope that you are catching this. This is an amazing principle. And as we read, you know, verse 10, I want you to focus on verse 10. I'm going to read from uh, the new uh, international version, the NIV. Okay, this is what Paul says. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. I want you to underline the word wise here. We're going to go into our point two here. Underline the word wise. Some of the translations says expert. Some say master. Paul says, I have laid the foundation as a wise builder. As I was building, I was building with wisdom. As I was building, I was building with, you know, expertise. In other words, with wisdom, I laid the foundation. In other words, with wisdom, I did my part. If you're taking down, uh, you know, the point, uh, here's point two, okay? You need wisdom to do your part. You need wisdom to do your part in this project. You need wisdom to do your part in this this project. Now, as I've been studying about, uh, you know, this theme for the last, you know, three weeks, I was really surprised the way the Bible connects wisdom and building. You know, when it comes to building, you know that, you know, it's important to have a plan. It's important to have the materials. I agree with that, okay? It's important to have personnel, people around you to build something. I understand. But I was actually surprised the way the Bible connects wisdom and building. Let me give you uh, some scriptures here, okay? Uh, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. How is a house built? It is built with wisdom. And then goes on to say, through knowledge its rooms are filled with every precious and beautiful treasure. In other words, to build a strong family, to build a strong house and have the house filled with treasure, you need knowledge, 
you need understanding and you need wisdom, knowledge and information. Understanding is how you apply it to your life and then wisdom is applying it. Just think about this. To build a strong family, nothing like love is mentioned, chemistry is mentioned. You understand, the Bible is telling us for us to have a strong house, a strong family. We need wisdom. That is the top. Knowledge is information. Understanding is, you know, you break it down how you can apply to your life. And then wisdom, you apply it. When you have wisdom, you build a strong house. Amen? I hope that you are catching that. Okay, Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 1. This is what it says. Wisdom has built her house. Wisdom becomes a person. Wisdom has built her house. You don't just have wisdom to build something. You become wisdom. In other words, that is how the Bible connects it. Let me read you another scripture. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. A wise woman who builds a home, a wise woman builds a home. But a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Now many of us have read this. We have, uh, you know have people preached on this and we think we understand it okay but if, let me re reread it a wise woman builds a home but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands this is what the scripture is saying a wise woman builds a house but a foolish woman doesn't stop building she in fact destroys what is already being built we think that when we are wise we build and when we are you know foolish we don't build no when we are foolish we don't just Stop building. We destroy what has already been built. That is the danger of building without wisdom. So I, I've told you, Paul says, I have done my part. I have laid the foundation as a wise builder. When I did it, I did it with wisdom. And we see throughout the Bible, especially in these references, that you, know, you need wisdom to build. Okay, we're going to unpack this. So who is a wise person? I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 7, the New Testament, a famous parable. Most of you would have heard it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. This is Jesus sharing. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, in other words, my teaching, and does them, whoever hears the word and practices it, I will liken him to a wise man who built a ho his house on the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." I want you to underline that. There is a cost when you walk in foolishness. You don't just stop building. You destroy what has already been built. You destroy. The Bible says great was its fall. Now, let me bring this together. There are two people spoken about in this parable. What's the similarity? Both of them are building. Both of them are building. What's the difference? One is building on the rock. One is building on the sand. Now, when you talk about this parable or even recite it for young people and or children and then you ask them, who is the wise person? Immediately they say, uh, it's the person who builds their house on the rock. But I think the Bible makes it clear that a wise person is not the one who builds the house on the rock, rather the one who does what God tells him. The one who practices what he listens. Rather, he is likened to a man who builds a house on the rock. So who is a wise person? A person who listens to God's word and practices it. A person who listens to God's word and puts it into practice. A person who hears and does what he has heard. This is how you build God's kingdom. When God's calling you to build his kingdom, he's not calling you to finish the project, but rather do your part. And for you to do your part, you need to be a wise builder. Like Paul, when he was laying the foundation, he said, I was a wise builder. In other words, what God's inviting you to do, to build his kingdom, wherever you are, right at the place where you are, what you need to do is hear God's word and do what it says. There's another 
interesting scripture uh, that brings this out. James chapter 3. Turn with me to James chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, an amazing chapter. Okay, if you have time, just take some time and read it. This is verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's way, prove it by living an honorable life. In other words, James is saying, you know, if, if you tell that you are wise, don't tell me that you are wise. Live it out. Show it in your works. If you say that you are wise, live it out by living an honorable life. They're going to go for one more scripture in the same book. James chapter 1 verse 22. This again talks about the danger. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. In other words, you are deceiving yourselves. I want you to remember the word that was said in the parable. The fall was great. A foolish person doesn't stop building, but rather destroys what is already being built. When you're just hearing and not doing what God says, you are deceiving yourself. Now, this is a bad place to be. In, a, in other words, a sad place to be. When someone manipulates, when someone deceives you, I mean, you might not figure it out the first time, but as time goes, you might discern and you'll figure it out. But what happens when you deceive yourself? When someone deceives, maybe you don't figure it out at the start, but you probably will find it out. Okay, there is some hope. But what happens when you deceive yourself? When you manipulate yourself? When you fool yourself? And this happens when you just hear God's word and not do it. That is the danger. This is how dangerous it is. No one can find out when you yourself are fooling yourself. Verse 23, For if you listen to the word, and don't obey. It is like glancing at the face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. Now, when James was writing this, obviously he was writing to a community where only the rich people had the luxury of having mirrors back then. So he was obviously, when you read the book of James, James is really mad at the rich people. Not that he doesn't like but the way they are, uh, you know, living and following Jesus does not fit with the Bible. So he is actually at them, okay, in every chapter. Okay, so here again, when he's talking about, you know, it's like looking at the mirror. Obviously, the community knows it's talking about the rich people. Now, when we are taking and applying this, obviously, all of us have well, not the luxury. It's a normal thing, okay? We get the chance to look at the mirror, Okay, average, uh, an average person would look at a mirror eight times. Some of you would say, you know, I don't do it as often as you say I do it. But some of you would say, you know, I kind of double it. I kind of do it 16 times. So, I'm going to ask you this question. You don't have to answer. Why do you look at a mirror? The first thing, when you look at a mirror, you are, you know, reminded how you look. Okay, that's how you are reminded. When you look at a mirror, you re are reminded how you look. And then, obviously, every time you look... Nine times out of ten, you are adjusting yourself, probably adjusting your hair, adjusting your shirt, or, you know, etc. Goes The list goes on. When you look into the mirror, you are reminded how you look, and then you adjust. But a person who just kept, keeps hearing and does not change his life is like a person who looks into the mirror and is reminded how he looks and doesn't make an adjustment, doesn't make a change. That is a dangerous place because he is deceiving himself. The reason that you look into a mirror is to be reminded who you are and to adjust. Same way when you open God's word, when you hear God's word, when you sit before God's word, you are reminded who you are. You are reminded what you need, what you lack. And God wants you to adjust. In other words, hear and put it into practice. So, when God calls you to build his kingdom, he's not inviting you to finish the project. No, David asked. He gathered the materials, but Solomon built. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who makes it grow. This is an ongoing project. Every generation is invited to build his kingdom. In other words, to do their part, to serve their generation. And as I close here, 
I would like to take it to a leadership perspective here. One of the great characters, you know, he's not one of the famous characters, but great in this way, he actually fulfills God's mission in his life, is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, who serves in the palace, is, you know, actually burdened uh, at the state of Jerusalem. And he comes back. He's so burdened, he leaves the palace, comes back, okay, to Jerusalem. And he works on this project of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And in chapter 3, okay, um, they appoint, you know, different people, groups, and families uh, to take different, uh, you know, parts of the wall and start building it at different gates. And in chapter 3, uh, you know, it gives a list of people who are involved and where they were involved. And I want to read you verse 1 here. Okay, this is the group that was involved. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work and rebuild the sheep gate. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priest. The leaders were leading from the front. The leaders were leading with wisdom. They were not just saying things. They were doing what they wanted to see others do in this project. The priests were not folding their hands and, you know, staying back and, you know, offering just wise counsel, okay, or some, you know, supervision. No. They were getting their hands dirty. They, have, they were getting their hands involved. They were leading from the front. This is specifically, I mean, a word for people who are in a leadership capacity. Somehow you are leading. And I know most of you are thinking, you know, I'm not there yet, okay? But I want to show you this picture here, okay? Now, this could happen at different levels, but this is a picture where, um, you know, you see a dad, you know, and his kid watching TV, and suddenly I think, you know, something comes up in the program, and the content is a little, uh, you know, um, uh, not good, Okay, for anyone to watch, probably it is an abusive content or sexual content. And immediately you see here right now, it's a father covering, uh, you know, the eyes of his kid. In other words, he's saying, you know, you cannot see it. But if you actually look at the picture, the father is seeing it. This is not how you lead or build with wisdom. This can happen for a group. This can happen at church. This can happen in your teams. Because for now, the kid thinks that he is not supposed to watch it. But when he comes big, grows big, and becomes his father's age, he is able to do what his father is actually doing now. I think the best thing the father could have done, I'm not building a case here, but he could have done is switched off. You lead with wisdom. In other words, wisdom is doing what God is asking you to do. Wisdom is doing and practicing the words of our God. So as we close, I want to pray for you. You're going to ask the Holy Spirit and thank Him that the burden should be taken off, that you're not asked to finish any project here but serve your generation. The men of Issachar knew their times. I pray such understanding comes over your life. You understand what you're supposed to do. You understand the community that you're serving. You understand the people that you're working. And you're not asked to do anything big and finish a big project here. No, you are called to do your part. Contribute to your generation by doing your part. That is what God is asking when He invites you to build His kingdom. And what you need to do, finish your job to serve your generation. Just like Paul, you need to be a wise builder. You need wisdom. Foolishness destroys and, and the cost is big. Don't deceive yourself. What you are hearing right now, what God is telling to you right now, put it into practice. That is how you keep building and lead by example. Lead by walking in wisdom. 
Can we take a moment? Let's take this moment and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you telling me this morning? There might be one particular area where the Lord is challenging you. He's been challenging you, but now very specifically, He wants you to put that into practice. You've been hearing enough about forgiveness. Now put it into practice. You've been hearing enough about humility. Don't just ask me to give you grace. Just do it. Don't deceive yourself. Do it. Be humble. Be forgiving. Walk in purity. Don't play with sin. Whatever it is, whatever area God's challenging you, I want you to walk in wisdom in that particular area. Father, we thank you that you have called us and given us an opportunity, Lord, to build upon your church. In other words, be part of this ongoing project. Thank you that you have called us not to a task that is overwhelming, but a task that you equip us to serve our generation. Help us to understand our times. Help us to serve our generation, Lord. But I especially pray for people who you have challenged them in different areas. I cast out the spirit of foolishness. I cast out the spirit of foolishness. I pray that your children will no longer be manipulated. I pray that your children will no longer walk in deception, Lord. That they will please you, but not just hearing your word, but by practicing it here. I pray that they will be able to tell that they are walking in wisdom by their works and by actions, Lord. Help us, my master, to lead with wisdom. To put into practice what you have asked us to. Thank you for continuing to offer us grace so that we can draw to you, Lord. Draw towards you. Thank you for the power of the gospel that it still sets us free. There is no bondage that is more powerful. Cannot be broken. The yoke is broken. The bondage is broken. Thank you for the power of the gospel and the grace that is offered through it, Lord. Father, we pray that you cleanse us with your blood and we pray that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray and all of us said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of our uh, service. Uh, I hope and pray that the word that you have listened to uh, really encourages you, inspires you and offers you hope. But ab above everything, I, I pray that, uh, that God will draw you close to him that you will be drawn to God. Wherever you are, you can be far away, you can sometimes be near and not yet with Him. This is the gospel shout, come back to Him. This is the gospel shout that I want to give to you. It's always a good time for you to come close to Him. Come to Him. Draw close to Him and He will draw close to you. And on a different note, if you're someone who is new here and if you haven't heard about Jesus, uh, I would like to ask you a personal question. This is a personal invitation. Despite of your experience, your religious experience, despite of what people have talked and told about, uh, you know, Jesus to you, or your experience with people who already know God, uh, here's my personal invitation. If you get an opportunity personally to know God, and to be known by God, to know the, the God of this universe who created this world, would you take it up? Despite of your experience, okay? Don't conclude on something because someone else told you that. Don't conclude on uh, a particular matter because that is what other people think. This is a personal invitation to you. If you get an opportunity to know God and be known by God, would you take it up? And if your answer is yes, I am very, very happy to tell you something, that there is a way. What Jesus has to offer to us cannot be compared to anything that can be offered by anyone else in this world. There's a way for you to know God and be known by God. And if you want to begin this journey at your own pace, okay, I would like you to pray this prayer with me. Would you look, pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I accept Jesus into my life. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I want to know you and be known by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much if you have prayed that prayer. 
I am so excited and proud of you for praying that prayer. And at your own pace, you don't have to do anything. But if you like to get to know about Jesus, of what the Bible says and what the Bible offers, we would like to really connect with you. You can write to us if you have any questions. You can write to us as misbahprayer at gmail.com. You've got the email. You can get connected with us as you begin this journey. And on a different note, if you're someone who needs prayer, who needs prayer because you are going through a financial crisis, you need prayer because you are going through a crisis in your marriage, uh, in your relationships. If you're going through a, a tough time uh, with your uh, with suffering a health condition, I would like to pray for you. I would really like to pray for you and pray along with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that we may have life and life more abundant. You are calling us to live a victorious life. You are calling us to live an overcoming life, Lord. I pray right now to every single person who is connected here that you will give them peace, peace over their lives, peace over their homes, oh my master. I pray restoration. I speak restoration over their marriages, over their relationships, Lord. I pray healing right now, wherever they are. They can be admitted in the hospital. They can be about going for a scan this time. They can be going for checkups this week, Lord. I pray for healing right now. I pray healing over their lives, over their bodies, Lord. Restore, restore good health, oh my master. Father, I pray for individuals who are waiting for a comeback in their life. They've, they've given up. They've, they've left everything. They're so hopeless, Lord. I pray that your word right now and your hand of blessing will be upon their lives, upon their businesses, upon their workplace. Lord, I pray that you will give them the comeback. You will restore their lives, restore their marriages, give peace and joy in their homes because you have called us to live an overcoming, victorious life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of us said, Amen, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for connecting with us. I hope that you will have a blessed week ahead and I pray for that. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for connecting. May God bless you.